Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Katerina. If you're new here, welcome. I post all types of videos, Jesus, Bible studies, talks, conversations, lifestyle, all the things. So if you're interested, please subscribe. All right, so today we are back with another Bible study in the book of James and it's going to be chapter five, I believe, right? Wait, no, chapter four. I'm sorry. Chapter four. We just finished up chapter three, so we're going to go into chapter four. Ooh. We only have chapter four and five left, which is exciting. So that's super cool. If you haven't checked out the other videos, go ahead and check them out. Um, I have a playlist with all of the ones of James so far. So, but we're going to go ahead and get into chapter four. By the way, I am using this a Bible, the Study Bible ESV by Crossway. If you're interested, I'll be reading from there and then also reading the little commentary things that they have in the bottom as well. So let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get into reading chapter four. So thank you, King Jesus, for this day, God. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, Lord, for your love, God. Thank you, Lord, for this time together, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word, God, that we have access to your word to get to know you and get to know what you want to speak to us, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing things to us. And we thank you, God, for this time together. Pray that you bless it, and thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. We love you, Lord, and it's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. So, James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels, and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you su suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Okay. <clears throat> Hold on, because there's a lot there. <laughs> Hold on now. Let's see. Okay. So let's go ahead and get into... You have not because you ask not, right? So you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Mm, I want to highlight that. Um, so let's see here. It says, this is a reminder that believers should ask God for what they seek rather than fighting each other. Mm. Prayerlessness results in failure to receive many of God's blessings. Eee. James does not imply that God wills to grant sinful, uh, selfish desires, but bringing requests before God can have a purifying influence on one's desires. That is so good. Because isn't it true as you grow closer with the Lord, like in your own life, if, if you can testify to this, um, that your desires change, like the things that you thought you wanted, um, they kind of just like disappear. Like the things that didn't glorify God, the things that were more selfish, um, like those things like just kind of fade away because what matters is him and what he wants in your life. And it's not to say that he doesn't care about your desires, but if they are just not like good for you, if they're sinful, if they just don't have any purpose, then, you know, he knows what you need. He's going to give you what you need. Um, but I think it's just so good because it says, you know, here, like what we read is that, um, bringing requests before God can have a purifying influence on one des one's desires, you know? So he will go ahead and take out those desires that don't really matter and you won't even have a desire for them anymore. And he will replace them with good things, you know? 
Um, so I love that so much. Let's see what else it says. It says, not all prayers are pleasing to God. Only those consistent with his will as revealed in scripture. Rather than seeking to honor God and advance his kingdom purposes, such prayers seek only to gratify self-centered passions. Mm. James is not saying all pleasure is wrong. Only pleasure that does not have the have the glory of God as the goal. Man, that is so good. I honestly have been convicted this past week, I would say, um, about selfishness and like just being selfish with my prayers, my time, my thoughts, just like me, 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 me. And just like getting consumed in things that like I don't need to be consumed with. Um, and it's so easy to get like that. And um, just like to get your eyes like, like not on Jesus, you know, like just to get distracted with things that just like are not like not worth your time or not even the season that you're supposed to be in. Um, so yeah, that convicts me because <laughs> and like what my um one of my pastors preached on at church this past Sunday was about like being selfish and just like, you know, not like like being so comfortable in our own little bubble in our world and not like thinking about other people, not praying for other people, not, you know, being generous, not, you know, giving your time for others, just like so many things. So this is just speaking right to me, child, right to me. Okay. Yeah. I think wherever you're at in your life, I feel like you can always take a look at your life and be like, yeah, I can do something for someone else. Like, yeah, I can pray more for somebody like, you know, because our sinful nature by, on its own is selfish by default. So we're always going to have that in us. It's just how much are we willing to lay down to be more like Jesus, to, you know, change more and just like serve more and love people more. Um, so good. Let's see what else we can go over here. Let's go over what it says over here about um, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Mm. So what I like about these two verses is that it's contingent on you. It's contingent on what you're going to do. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. That means you got to submit yourself to God. God's not going to make you submit yourself to him. You have to do it, right? And then it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Who has to resist the devil? God's not going to resist the devil for you. You resist the devil and then he will flee from you. Wow. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Mm. Oh. It doesn't say it the other way around. It doesn't say God's going to draw near to you and then you can draw near to him. God is always pursuing you, first of all. But what this is saying is if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Like he is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. So the more that you seek him and the more that you want to want himself to be revealed to you, you will see that because he's always there. Um, that is just so good. Mm. Let me see if what this says about that part specifically. What was that? Those are verses seven and eight. Yeah, seven and eight. Let's see. The only way to resist the devil is by also submitting and drawing an heir to God. Mm. Satan will be defeated and will have to flee as he indeed, as indeed he did from Christ in Luke chapter four, verse 13. Mm. So good, so good. Okay, what else? Here we go. Do not speak. Okay, we're gonna get into, uh, let me see here really quick. We're gonna finish this chapter. Yeah, we can finish it up. Um, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? James said, but who are you? <laughs> James got a little sass. I'm not going to lie to you. He be coming for us. Mm, all right, go off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let me see what it has to say about that. 
Um, James restates the basic problem behind the issues discussed in chapter 3. The misuse of the tongue to speak evil or to slander others. Speaking ill of others is a result of all the arrogant boasting, jealousy, self-centered desires, and pride that James is warning against. Mm. Such slanderous conduct is decreed in both the Old, Tos Tes Old Testament. Um, okay. When a person begins to judge the law, he is, I don't know that word, usurping the place of one lawgiver and judge. God alone gave the law and he alone is judge of all. Hallelujah. Mm, okay, let's go ahead and continue on. Verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Ugh. Okay, wait, there's a lot here. Wow, okay. Mm. I love this. I love this so much. Okay, it's <laughs> so good. That's why, you know, when people say like, Lord, Lord willing, God willing. Yeah, like, because if God wills, it'll be done. And it's good to have a plan. You know, like we, we know, like, it's good to have a plan. It's good to be organized and all these things. But at the end of the day, like, we really don't know what's going to happen today. I don't know what's going to happen within the next five minutes. I don't know what's going to happen next week. I have plans. I do have plans. Um, after this video, I might go eat something. That's my plan. But it might not happen. I don't know. I don't know. You know, James said, what is your life? James is coming, like, for us. I'm, I don't have to talk to him in heaven. I'm just kidding. But he's like, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. <laughs> Yo. No, but for real. It's so true. This is really humbling. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so good. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And then I love this part. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Listen, a lot of people think that like you can be like Switzerland and like, you know, not say anything, not and be passive and do all these things. But it's the Bible says, so whoever knows the right thing to do, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it because you want to be passive and you don't want to get involved or whatever it is, and you fail to do it for him, it is sin. It is sin for you. So be mindful of that. Just going to drop that there. Put it into whatever context you think it should go into, into your life. But I'm just saying, don't be passive because it says, if you know the right thing to do and you fail to do it, you're sinning. So there's that. Um, okay, let's see what my Bible has to say about this. Let's see. Boasting about tomorrow, James addresses merchants, showing that the sovereignty of God precludes presumption and arrogance in making one's plans. Mm. On the surface, this sounds like good business sense, but it makes a secular worldview that ignores God. See, that's good. Oh, that's so good. Mm. Because it's not like it's saying not to make plans, but it's saying like, you have to include God in your plans. Like, what does God have to say about what you want to do tomorrow? What does God have to say about you wanting to move somewhere in a year? You know what I'm saying? Oh, that is so good. These people are probably Christians belonging to the wealthy merchant class, whereas the rich people mentioned in verses one through six are probably not believers. Right. Mm -mm -mm. So good. If the Lord wills with Lord, referring to Yahweh as a creator who sustains the universe and whose will controls all that happens, every business decision must be based on submission to God's will. That is so good. I need to write that down. Oh, so good. You don't want to have a business and not have God in it. It's going to fail. I mean, it might succeed, but it's not going to have the blessing of the Lord. It's not going to have his hand on it. So include God in every single thing that you do. Mm. Okay. Well, that was chapter four, you guys. We went through it. 
we're gonna get into chapter five in the next couple videos but um chapter four look at us trucking through james honestly this has convicted me so much i mean every video i'm getting convicted so this is great for me i love this i hope you guys are loving it i think it's great um but thank you guys so much for watching thank you so much for subscribing if you haven't please subscribe um please like this video if you've enjoyed it look out for future videos um and yeah i pray that you guys are all doing well if you have any prayer requests you can message me on instagram or comment down below i would love to pray for you um and i think that's it so i'll see you guys in the next video don't forget to be the best person you can be and to love on people remember jesus loves you and i'll see you guys all soon bye